Okay, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, before we get started with the introductions of, of our panelists, um, I'd like to do a quick, a quick test to see who we have in the audience and maybe, you know, get a, get a feel for you guys to see what, you know, the, the, the interests of the audience are and where we're at. So before we get started, can you please raise your hand if you have ever owned or traded cryptocurrencies? So put up your hand, nice and high, nice and high. Okay, all right, we got some crypto people in here. Who here, keep your hand up if you're gonna be, if you've ever owned Livepeer tokens? Owned Livepeer tokens, good. And of those people, how many of them have ever delegated to an orchestrator? Hands up, nice and high, nice and high. Okay. Well, this is our opportunity to convert you guys to delegate to some orchestrators. <laughs> but, um, but that being said, um, what's really cool about the Live Peer Network is we have these node operators, and they come in from around the globe. Uh, everyone here is from different parts of the earth, and, and we provide resources in a decentralized, permissionless way. So um, on the very left here, we have Frank, who runs the Ultima Ratio node, uh, Ultima Ratio Orchestrator. We have Chris, who is a longtime transcoder and orchestrator. We have Alex, who runs the Syrinx orchestrator. And we have Varies, who runs the Varies and Numers orchestrator. So again, please round of applause for our audience or our <laughs> panelists. So let's get to know our panelists a little bit. And I'll start with, with the first question. And it's very simple. I'd like to know how these people learned about LivePeer and what their first experience was. So we'll start at the very end. Frank, could you tell us a little bit about how you learned about LivePeer and how you got involved? Okay, mm, thank you. I'm sorry for my English, it's not very good, so I will try uh, to do my best. Uh, so um, I start uh, with LivePeer. Uh, at the beginning, uh, I uh, found some LivePeer on my uh, ETH account and uh, I um, I was uh, interested by that, say, what's that? Uh, what, I have life here on my account, so uh, I check on internet and uh, discover the, this, uh, this uh, program to, uh, to uh, encode video, and uh, that was very interesting. So uh, I, wa I was start uh, with uh, Nikovi uh, uh, nodes. It's a, um, it's a node uh, who was open for uh, all uh, people who want to join. So I start with that. And a few months ago, in May uh, 2021, uh, my wife uh, uh, decided to create a node uh, on a, a computer, on Windows. So uh, we start like that. And a few months uh, after, she asked me uh, to help uh, her to uh, create a node uh, on Linux because uh, she don't know Linux at all. So I create the first node. And, uh, uh, when uh, uh, with uh, all the community, we start to be very interested by that, and we create other nodes over the world, uh, and uh, that uh, we are very very enthusiastic since uh, one years because uh, because uh, the team is just incredible and the community is incredible, and that's all. <laughs> Thank you. Very cool, Chris. Okay, I'll, I'll try and keep this as succinct as I can, but it, I might struggle. Chris, you're not succinct about anything. You Thank keep you. going and going. Thank no, you, no, Titan. go ahead, go ahead. Thank you, Titan. So, okay, I I just come back. How, so how I found out about LivePeer, I had just come back from like a, a two-year traveling trip where I'd been trying to get myself away from the computer because I spent so much time at the computer or at the screen. And I'd had two years away, and when I came back, there was some things started to interest me on the computers again. And one of these things was this thing called Bitcoin, which maybe some people in the room have heard of. And the other thing I saw was this thing called live streaming, because I'd been away, I'd missed all the Meerkat stuff and Facebook Live and YouTube Live, and, and I came back and I'm like, this seems interesting, this cryptocurrency and this live streaming thing. And I thought, oh gosh, well, I've got to kind of focus my efforts down onto one of these things to kind of research and find out more about, but I just simply couldn't. And I kept on researching both of these things. And after some time, I thought, wow, all this kind of like decentralized network storage platforms like IPFS, they're just so wholesome and good for the world. Like, but why in my live streaming, I'm doing it all via Facebook and YouTube. And it's like a lot of hard work doing it via these plat channels. Could we build some sort of system that is like 
decentralized live streaming. So I talked to a few people and said, hey, what do you think of this idea? And people were like, yeah, good idea, whatever. And then someone wrote back and said, someone, the, the guy who founded IPFS wrote back to me one day and said, have you seen Live Pit? And I was like, I've never heard of this thing, quickly looked it up, and my first reaction was, God damn it, someone's doing it already. <laughs> they already got the idea. No, I've got to, there's my competition. Should I try and compete with them? Should I try and do with, oh, they already look quite sophisticated. They have a white paper and everything. They are and they look like they've got some like technical implementation, and I'm just a guy with some ideas. Uh, wait, maybe I could make friends with them. <laughs> maybe I could help them. Maybe I could like be part of this. So I wrote an email, I think, to Doug and Eric and said, hey, uh, what you're doing I think is really cool. Uh, I'd like to know if I could help somehow. Um, and uh, I think that maybe answers the question. Very good, yeah. No, Thank that's, you. That's amazing. Succinct. And and Chris is a long time, long time uh, a part of the network. So we're great, great to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Alex, tell us a little bit about your experience. Yeah, so it, it's actually... I didn't know this, but, it, but it's quite similar to Chris. Um, so the first, I, I think it was either 2017 or 2018. Uh, so it was right after I graduated college, uh, and it was in Boston. And I, uh, a friend of mine um, at MIT was like, yeah, like the guy who started IPFS is presenting like IP. Like he's just going to talk about it for an hour. So I thought, okay, like I'll, I'll go and like we'll, we'll see what that's like. Um, and uh, so he does his talk, and then I... It was very interesting because IPFS was kind of a novel thing at the time. And uh, sure enough, like afterwards, um, he was like, yeah, I have to go like, look at this. I'm like, saw this cool thing. And, and he was very enamored with like, you know, IPFS is great, but it can't really do anything live. And uh, yeah, so Juan Benet was just like floored with live peer. Um, and I was like, okay, I think I'll look into this. Like Juan, Juan's a smart guy. Um, so that was my first real engagement. Um, and uh, I should have, tried to get more LPT then, but uh, that, uh, that didn't happen for another like two years. So, so yeah, so uh, oddly enough, uh, IPFS guys were kind of the biggest initial push for me. And then yeah, like LPT just showed up in my ledger at some point. So yeah, that, that worked too, that, that strategy also worked. Yeah, very. <laughs> I, I, I li yeah, there's the Merkle mine, I believe, which is um, which is the, the method of airdropping people uh, the LPT tokens. Which at 120, we'll be talking about the the live peer economics, and I'll, that's actually one of the questions I have for Doug around that strategy over in the other room at 120. So, uh, very good to see you, Alex. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and we have Varys. Varys, would you like to um, tell us your experience? Sure. Um, so I got into Ethereum or like the blockchain space in general in like. 2016 or something and then I was just like really hooked ever since and I was like researching all the different projects and I think I came to a live peer through like a reddit post or then like a blog post back then I think Twitter wasn't that like the main um, hub um, and yeah I took part in the Merkle mine actually in the token distribution and I think in like early 2018 I set up my own orchestrator and I mean I started off as a delegator but then I noticed that the orchestrator to which I was delegating to um, they weren't like really reliable and they weren't do doing the daily rework calls some were just increasing their fees with like no announcement whatsoever from one round to another and then I decided, um, yeah, I can do better, and I set up my own orchestrator. And I was also hoping, of course, to attract some stake by providing a highly reliable but low-fee orchestrator. Very good. Thank you so much for joining us, Fairies. And if the audience ever has a question, um, I'm not going to hold it to the end. If you've got a question, just throw up your hand, and, uh, and we can get to you right away um, if you want to ask any questions. Um, do we have a microphone that can go back there? Or do you want to just shout it out? And, and I'll So I, I believe the question is um, uh, scaling live peer to tens of thousands of people. Why is that important? Right? I guess is that the, is that the question? No, uh, the question is why is it so convenient? Why, ah. why is it what? 
why is it not millions? Why, oh, why is it why not millions? It oh my goodness, absolutely. Millions. I like your thought process. Think Ten big, million. you know? Get out of the room. You're thinking too small. Um, does anyone, who wants to take that question? Who's got an answer, they think? Chris, you just sighed. Like, I don't know. Like, there's something about you, you don't want to scare people with numbers that are way, way big when you present stuff. Like if you start saying infinite or billions and millions. Like, as I understand it, the architecture of the network is designed in a way where it, it can scale, quote unquote, infinitely if there's enough capacity provided in terms of GPUs. So, like, I don't know why 10,000 was the number brought up, um, but I'm kind of aware that it's possible to scale far beyond something like that. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, yeah, like it wasn't our slide, obviously, so we'd have to probably ask Doug. But um, <laughs> no, I think I think uh, any number you put out now is um, it can be more or less, just depending on the growth of the network and demand. So, um, yeah, very good. And like I said, if you got a question, hopefully that answers your question. Um, cool, cool. Okay, um, let's let's keep moving on. Um, Another question, and if you guys have a question for each other, feel free to butt in and, and ask each other questions and, and, and keep going. Um, so the, the, next, the next question I have, and I'll start with um, Alex for this one, um, and at random, this is not, I'm not just picking on anyone. Um, I guess, what, what has been the most satisfying experience of being a video miner? Uh, well, I had a bunch of quadros I wasn't using for anything that interesting, and now, now I have something that's pretty interesting to use them for. Um, so yeah, so there's that part. I, I think um, the other thing is, as like a relatively technical person, uh, there's a lot of leniency on both sides. So like, I forked stuff, and then uh, people like you and Joey, uh, some other nodes, have been very receptive to that. And um, yeah, I don't know. It, it's been a very iterative project as well. There's some projects that will sort of like, you know, they'll have a peak of a lot of throughput development-wise, and uh, live peers had a lot of just bandwidth uh, in general. So it's been, yeah, good for using the GPUs that I've been sitting around and uh, a, a great excuse to have really fast internet. Um, that's, my girlfriend has no clue why we need a two gig connection, but now we do, so that's. Anything to convince your girlfriend of just about anything is a good idea. Thank Live Peer for that. Um, uh, Frank, what, what, again, most satisfying uh, um, experience with, with running your orchestrator node at, uh, uh, thus I far? I think for us, uh, it's a uh, feeling being part of, uh, of uh, this, uh, um, these things. It's a very sat uh, big satisfaction for us. All day we are uh, monitoring uh, our node uh, from uh, home and uh, we see uh, the the um, demands growing, and uh, uh, and we have all the community and the team behind to help us, and we can exchange all at any hours in the day because it's uh, worldwide. So uh, we 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 really uh, feel part of something very uh, interesting and growing, and uh, it's why uh, I think uh, we love a lot. <laughs> yeah, I, I find the community aspect really amazing. By show of hands, who here? is in a Web3 community thus far, right? Put up your hand in, in some fashion. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing to see that, that people feel welcomed in Web3, whereas, you know, do you really feel welcomed at YouTube or, or these big corporate giants, right? It's not quite no. the same. Um, no, no, I would agree. Very uh, satisfying. What has been your most satisfying experience? I guess, like, through the monitoring, you can really see what's happening on your orchestrator. So it really helps to like visualize what our nodes are actually doing. And one stat that really impressed me is like, I can see that I'm transcoding many weeks of video per day, which is to me like mind blowing. Like I didn't imagine that it was that much, but that's, it's really great to see that, that it's possible for like an individual to transcode, help transcoding that much stream. Very cool. And Chris, satisfying? Yeah, I, th I think for me it's something about seeing, like Frank hit the nail on the head with like feeling part of something, but, but seeing the evidence that fellow orchestrators on the network are starting to like get value from the protocol, not only in terms of fees and winning tickets, but also being able to call a reward and get a share of the inflation and start to kind of 
like see the trickle of real financial value coming into their control, it's like, you know, we're onto something here. Very cool. Now, I want to shift gears a little bit because we talked about the great things of live peer. We talked about the transformative global problem that live peer is solving, which is to be the world's globe, uh, world's open video infrastructure. Let, let's talk about the challenges that 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 you face as running an orchestrator node. Um, Frank, let's let's start you off over there. What what are some of the challenges you faced um, when when operating? And um, yeah, what? Give us an example. Um, I don't know. At the beginning, uh, that was to uh, keeping a reliable node because it's only uh, in ho our home at the beginning. So we have to always be sure uh, your internet connection was uh, okay. So I s um, I contact the IPS and say maybe I can I have a second uh, box or something like that to be sure uh, I will not uh, be uh, cut from the network. So after we start to uh, create node uh, and uh, rent uh, server around the world, so I sleep well <laughs> because uh, I say it's okay if I uh, operate at home, it's okay that uh, keep running uh, somewhere, so it's okay. So th that was the most diffi difficult part for us uh, at the beginning to uh, um, uh, succeed in uh, create node and uh, monitoring them and uh, we uh, learn a lot of things about uh, Linux and uh, uh, blockchain, etc. So uh, that's great, anyway. Very good. Um, <laughs> Varys, I know you've been operating a node for uh, about four years now. You said 2018. Um, I'm sure you've been a lot been through a lot of the growth. What what have what challenges have you faced since then? And and um, uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I guess the biggest challenge definitely was when the Ethereum network was really congested, so it's not per se a live peer problem, but more like, I mean, the daily rework calls were costing in the hundreds of dollars, and that was really, it required a lot of manual attention for the node, so you had to plan your rework calls, because I didn't want my stakers to miss out on the inflationary live peer tokens, um, but then you had to, yeah, to plan the transaction or to see if it actually went through by setting a lower gas price, so that was a struggle, but luckily that's behind us now with the layer two migration. Um, apart from that, I mean, it was just back then, like it was three years ago when I set up the node, there weren't that many tutorial or like help available. So, and I didn't have any DevOps knowledge whatsoever. So that was definitely a, a learning experience. Um, but yeah, I think now we've come a really long way with like custom implementation of the of the orchestrator software and with the Discord, all the help, all the tutorials and layer two. Alex, same question. Frustrations, challenges you faced? Uh, well, initially it was finding cheap GPUs with fast bandwidth. Um, I, it, it's interesting because at least in North America, a lot of the cheaply available GPU hosts are, they're run by like single people. Uh, like VelociHost is actually one guy, which I had no clue. Um, and explaining to them why you need like one GPU and uh, like 20 terabytes of bandwidth was, uh, they were like, why Like, why would you want that? Um, so yeah, that, that was an initial challenge before I could run stuff from my home. Um, and then initially, I mean, there wasn't a ton of documentation, but that didn't bother me too much because I could find what I needed. Um, yeah, so mostly just L1 stuff. Uh, like when it you know was four hundred dollars to claim a ticket and uh, uh, understanding if stuff was working initially. I mean, I, I think I got lucky because I, I, I was one of few people who had like two tickets within I think the first four days of running an orchestrator. Um, but of course, it made sense that there were there were lots of others who for weeks would be like, I'm not sure that everything is right and like you know. So there were problems I didn't encounter, but I'd say the L1 stuff was big, um, and then just finding hardware that wasn't financially just like ludicrous to host. Because um, like if you were if you were to go to Amazon and even with spot instances, uh, which you can rent more cheaply, um, the economics don't make sense. But, uh, but yeah. Yeah, la layer one fees were, I want to say a right bitch, but uh, that's <laughs> probably not right to say. Well, I did already. Um, okay, uh, Chris, tell us a little bit about, um, tell us a little bit about your challenges you face. I, I think for me it's, there's something about debugging the complexity of the stack that you've 
put out there. So like if you put a vanilla orchestrator out there, you've got like your internet connection, you've got your server, you've got connection to blockchain, you've got um, like is my are my ports open? So you start something up and like it's like, okay, how do I know if this thing is working or not? Like, have I done it right? And then suddenly you get a stream come in and you're like, oh wow, okay, right, so streams can come in. But wait, I didn't get a ticket yet. So maybe is my is the ticket, uh, am I getting tickets? Do I just have to be patient and wait for a winning ticket? Or is there some issue with how I'm claiming the ticket? And maybe there isn't an issue with claiming the ticket. And actually then suddenly all my streams stop. And like, did I do something bad? Like, did I do something wrong? Or did just the broadcaster just stop broadcasting? Or maybe the broadcaster like started using a different orchestrator because they found someone better and someone better came onto the networks. Like, or maybe it's just my internet connections die. Like, I don't, I don't know what, like, so it's like observability of the, the different um, interconnectivity between the different components that we use and helping people to, to first to, to like get a sense check that yeah, yeah, they, you've done it right and everything is fine, you've received ticket, some of the monitoring stuff is really good for that, but I still think we have a way to go for new joiners of the network to kind of feel like they've they've done it and they're they're ready now and they can start actually adding capacity to this network. Absolutely. Um, any any questions in the audience regarding regarding any of this stuff? Yes, go ahead. Great, thank you so much. So the question is, um, is, it, is it difficult to become an orchestrator and, and what's being done to maybe simplify that process and, and improve that? Um, and actually, we have Alex here who is, um, um, what is your title, uh, product? Product lead? I'm a TPM. TPM, I don't even know what that means, but I'll let Alex answer this question because I think he can have some good insight. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I guess the, the first thing is, is, is how long you're, you're willing to wait out for this to become a, a profitable enterprise. I, I guess if you, if you have more money to throw at this initially, uh, you'll be able to attract more state or more stake in theory. Um, so yeah, I think now with L2, it's cheaper than it's ever been before. Um, and the barrier to entry in terms of performance is a little bit lower. Um, uh, other than barrier of entry, technically, how difficult is it? And, and what are you working on maybe to, to improve that process? Sure, so it's still um, relatively technical. I mean, you can run on Windows or Linux. Uh, I think the, the learning curve for Linux is probably worth it because um, it's a bit more stable and it's easier to find resources to, like if you don't have a great internet connection, GPUs that are Linux based are easier to find. So I think uh, if you're willing to get through that uh, learning curve, it's not too bad. There's a lot of uh, great information available. And I think other than that, um, just having like a basic understanding of how to you know, use a hardware wallet or to navigate um, bridging infrastructure in um, with the Ethereum network, which is still quite new. Um, I think if you can get through that, those are the main hurdles. And then otherwise, it's mostly DevOps. Um, so having reasonable ways to making sure that you know, your box is up and uh, doing the things it should be doing. Um, how, how simple do you think it should be? Um, it, it, do you think Live here should aim towards you know, a, a, a one-click um, launch for an orchestrator? Or is there always going to be that element of of experience required to, to run an orchestrator node? Like, how simple or complex should it be, ideally, do you think? Um, so for me personally, I, I think uh, like a, a, a one click, like download something and then just one click and you can start uh, transcoding. I think that might be more simple than we'd want it. Because um, you can only grant so much reliability and performance with that. So if you wanted maybe just a node to learn with or because you just wanted to understand more about the Lightfree network, that could be a good option. But I think um, for orchestrators that actually want to break even or um, compete with, say, the top half of other orchestrators, I think uh, there's an inherent sort of technical gap you have to breach. And um, I think there's a lot of value just generally um, for like the, the Web3 community um, 
for people just to learn that way. So I think, you know, at some point it, it should be really simple, but I think there, especially for the with the way the, like the network is now, there are benefits to it inherently being a little bit more technical. So, and for instance, like you'd never be able, I, I don't think having a one click um, solution would ever quite work for having, uh, you know, six nodes distributed across North America. Sure. But um, for one, it would be, you know, I think reasonable. Yeah, absolutely. Chris, you're nodding your head. Yeah. Jump in. I also, like on the on the question, I think it's it's something that the there is huge amounts of documentation out there on setting up an orchestrator node. Like there's video tutorials, there's stuff that LivePeer Inc. publish, there's like independent community contributions that have said this is how I set up a, a, a node. One thing I would really recommend if you're interested in running an orchestrator, do it on a testnet first. And like you can, there's full instructions about how to set something up on Arbitrum testnet, and doesn't have to cost you any money. If any mistakes get made, whatever, and you can set the thing fully up on Arbitrum testnet and LivePeer testnet. And when you're ready to go mainnet, it's just exactly the same approach, but just mainnet instead of testnet. So there's like a really nice kind of sandbox breeding ground for 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 new orchestrators to just learn the mechanics in a safe and zero cost environment that once you kind of feel confident to then take the step up to mainnet, it's just a flick a few variables and you're on mainnet. Wonderful. We got about nine minutes left, so if you do have another question, put up your hand. This is a really quick question, or maybe it's not, I don't know. Um, time commitments. Um, is this a full-time gig, a part-time gig? How much time do you spend working on your orchestrator node um, in general? I'll start with uh, Vires. Um. Great question. Yeah, I think in general I'm probably spending like for sure one to two hours per day, but that's more like by choice, I would say, because I like the community. I like um, yeah, messing around with, with the live peer stuff, like the monitoring, the tooling. Um, but for example, when I'm on holidays, I can really like scale it down to like one hour per week or something, just like check if everything is running. I mean, I've set up multiple monitoring tools, um, so I get alerted if something is wrong. So if I want to, I can just like, you know, shut down myself and relax a bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, I really like spending time in the community. So I guess it's, for me, it's not a full-time gig, um, but definitely one of the biggest time commitments from my side. Very good, Alex. I'll be quick, but I, I think um, if you put more work into your DevOps stuff, uh, then down the road you'll just have less time worrying about uh, whether your node is up. So, and then like like Ferris, I, I just like looking at it sometimes. You know, <laughs> it's, it's fun yeah. to do. It's a nice way to kill time. Just but. sitting. Yeah, I, my fiance is like, why is there a big screen TV with your node on it? Like, yeah. <laughs> can you can you not have that on? And I'm like, yeah, but look at it. Look at all the streams. That see. Minute, oh. and there goes my water. Um, that's okay. It's it'll it'll evaporate. Streaming. It's streaming. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm too distracted. My fiance is like, what are you doing? Um, Chris, I, I would say answer in answer to your question, how much you need to s time you need to spend. I would say it really is as little or as much as you want. Like, it can be as little as check your phone to see the notification that the node called reward that day, and then in some ways kind of like that's done, maybe just check that it's processing streams and it's not zero streams, there may be something to debug, and that could be like, you know, 30 seconds first thing in the morning, and then you forget about it for the rest of the day. Also, like, you can spend 16 waking hours every day researching stuff, like watching what's happening in the community, reading new documentation, like trying new things, thinking about projects for how to improve your setup so that it's more reliable and robust. So it's kind of like the entire spectrum of how much you want to put into it. And I really feel like the more you put into it, to in answer to your question, how much you need to s time you need to spend, I would say it really is as little or as much as you want. Like it can be as little as check your phone to see the notification that the node called reward that day and then in some ways kind of like that's done maybe just check that it's processing streams and it's not zero streams there may be something to debug and that could be like you know 30 seconds first thing in the morning and then you forget about it for the rest of the day also like you can spend 16 waking hours every day researching stuff 
like watching what's happening in the community, reading new documentation, like trying new things, thinking about projects for how to improve your setup so that it's more reliable and robust. So it's kind of like the entire spectrum of how much you want to put into uh, our uh, um, network. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Can we please get a round of applause for our panelists? <laughs>